Hey, thank you for waiting. Good evening. Uh, I'm not a troll, I'm a real person. And uh, if there is somebody listening uh, in these realms of uh, intelligence, then they'll probably know exactly who I am. I can read the Egyptian language. I can also read cuneiform. Okay, I can't. Is somebody talking? I can't hear him. Yes, Scotty, you want to drop down and come back up? Uh, Rick can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Rick, can you hear Scotty? No, I didn't hear anybody. I knew, okay, I knew Scotty, you. drop down. Okay, Scotty, remove yourself from speaker and jump back up. And in the meantime, we'll go to the man in the shadows. The man in the shadows, are you yes, there? Yes, I can hear you. Rick, can you hear Yeah, him? I can hear him. Okay, great. So, you said that you were doing that form, and you signed it. Um, what exactly did you... What can you say, exactly? As far as that form goes. What form? For the, the uh, form? Yep. The other form you're talking about, the 86 or the uh, oh, 19. Oh, the form. Yep, the yes, form. yes. Oh, the form, okay. The Sorry form, about that. The, the, the title of the form is Sensitive Compartmented Information Debriefing Memorandum. Correct. It, it reads, this memorandum records the fact that I was debriefed on a day on the following sensitive compartmented information, special access programs. And it says it lists only the underclassified ones. And there's a list of things that I in there, and it says uh, the next paragraph. I was reminded of the need for special protection of SCI material, of the fact that access to this material is governed by the terms of the SCI non-disclosure agreement that I previously signed, and of my continuing obligation to comply with the terms of that agreement. Correct. And then there's a signature block next to organization, my name. And it's got the signature, number. and then the uh, signatures and all that good stuff. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and then at the bottom, it, there's a, a statement on the Privacy Act and and so forth, and that's DD Form eighteen forty eight. That's right, eighteen forty eight. Man, it's been a while. Um, so you, so uh, as far as the, I was listening in a little bit about what you were saying as far as. The uh, oh, what's it called over in Washington that they were trying to figure out a protocol because I remember there wasn't any protocol for people who were abductees, and I, I was overhearing that and I was like, wow, that's actually some of the things that uh, I was conducting and figuring out how to fix. Actually, and when were you in? I wasn't a formally in, I was actually a part of more of the politics side than anything. Um, I was vetted in within a group of people that needed a problem to solve, so I solved it. For example, this is a great summary, um, like a cloud seeding project, for example. I worked on that for a while, since 20, uh, 2018, 2019, something like that. And uh, the project has been flourishing s since. You said a cloud seeding? Is that what you said? Yep, cloud seeding project. Yep. Okay. It was over in uh, California. We talked to some scientists there. Sold an idea with them that could actually help better um, with the drought process when it comes to California, New Mexico, Nebraska, Texas, Las Vegas, Oregon, Washington, all that sort of jazz. And... Um, some of the particles that were in there is a little bit different. For example, like instead of using a traditional system where they send out a laser, get the data back, figure out what clouds that need to be seeded or not, and then send out a Shesna directly in, I thought that was, and then the percentages were low. So I was like, well, instead of that, why don't we just create a blanket over the horizon? Uh, certain areas cloud seed over 10,000 feet with a 737s or 747s and then um, with a mixture of a different type of chemical that has a, a better changing Sorry. reaction 
So I want to ask you, do you have any uh, affiliation or experience with the ET or UFO phenomenon? If you do have knowledge about that, can you confirm anything that you've heard Rick say that would match up with your own personal experiences? Yeah. So, for example, um, with the abduction cases, there, like I said, there, he was right. There wasn't a form. So for me, I talked to some people in the Senate and the intelligence community back in 2019, I would say, to have a more of a better structure. And I talked with, uh, before I talked with people that were in, like, that new Greer or people like that, and just really go from there. But as far as an actual abduction case, I have never had one, but I have had something very similar. As f that's a little bit different. Um... I was over at the Nelson's Landing area um, talking about my company, trying to figure out what we wanted to do. And it was just all 10 of us. One of my friends was a uh, was in the Army, Navy, you know, all good stuff. We are just talking about how we want to build our company. Back, in, uh, back during that time, we're at the Nelson's viewpoint, and we saw this red dot kind of in the distance. We didn't think much of it. We kept talking. And then um, it got big, actually. It got really big. It was it had no sound. Didn't detect anything. I didn't see anything on radar. You know, all that good stuff. Our, all of our cars shut off. All four of them. It was his GMC from the 1990s. Some other vehicle from the 80s. My friend's Porsche from the early 2000s in my personal vehicle. They all got shut off. I couldn't st we all couldn't start our own vehicles. As the as this thing got even closer, there's probably like maybe like f between 50 50 to 75 feet from us up in the sky. And um, I shared a little bit about this, but anyways, um what, st what state was that in? Nelson's? I'm not familiar Nelson's with Nelson's Landing is actually in Las Vegas. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah, well, we know that the aliens are coming to Las Vegas. Rick Doty knows that for a fact, and uh, I'm going to have to confirm that. Do you have a question for Rick? Because we got a lot of hands up, bro. Yeah, so any, long story short, um, it landed right in front of us, and we saw this being. It was looked like a 11-foot, like, I mean, I'm sorry, it was like 4-foot 11. Um, my friend almost shot it, uh, but he didn't. Because I pulled him, I pulled a gun down from him. I was like, "Don't shoot it." I don't know what this thing is capable of. I have some sketches that I have on my uh, on my page, but uh, we started having during the time when that thing landed. I did touch the craft. Um, yeah, it just I, why did, why did you do I, that? Or, I, mean, I actually what, don't know. I just felt I don't know. I just was drawn to it. It was. I felt like I needed to. I don't know. It was really weird. And then after that, I started having... Um, all of us were affected in different ways. For example, I started having um, like dreams after that. It was really compelling. Um, my other friend, he got nausea. He threw up <laughs> on the other side. But I remember what the this being said. It just said, take care of your planet. I don't, I don't know why it said that to us. We all thought we were hallucinating and having problems. We were like, was something wrong with our drink? But uh, a week goes by, long story short, my friend had a, a lucid dream at like 12 a.m. Uh, he was obligated to go there, so we, him and his wife went. He didn't even tell me. Um, I had the same dream about a week later. So all of us were there, and we're confused because we never got, got, gotten in contact with any of each other. So I thought that was very strange. And then again, this uh, the same type of craft, I'm guessing, because it didn't land this time. It just started making weird patterns left to right, left to right, up, down, went into the water, lift itself up. It was very... Uh, I got scared. I was like, fuck this. I'm going home. So I left. Was the question, Did you want to ask a question about your yeah, has, experience? Has anybody have What's the question? The question I'm having for Rick: Has anybody had that experience before? 
Uh, I'm sure. Do you, have any, do you have any story direct that would relate that story? And uh, another real quick is, uh, I don't disbelieve your story, but the man and and the the billionaire man, are you are you trolling? Or are you being sincere right now? I just want to ask that straight up. No, I I I'm not trolling. Um, I'm actually being genuine. I actually even gotten tried to get in contact with Mufon, but there was it was a different response. Um, so my understanding that your question for Rick is, does he know anybody else that has had similar experiences to what you just shared? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm asking. Okay, let's give them a chance to answer. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've heard similar stories from from many other people. Uh, not, not any that I investigated while I was in, but since I've been out in, in the public, uh, I've... I'm approached by many, many people, every, almost every UFO convention, telling me different stories about abductions. And I've heard, I've heard similar stories. Yes, I, I can say that. Thank you, Rick. Okay, just to reset so people know where they're at. Jay Neal, you're up next, then NHI, then James, and then we'll cycle to M. If anybody else on the stage wants to jump in the lineup, please put your hand up. Thank you. Go ahead, Jay Neal. Hey, Rick, it's Neil. How's it going? I know. Good. Um, so I had a question uh, on hybrids. Um, we've we've talked before about hybrids, and you mentioned that there's ways that that people can even tell if somebody's a hybrid. But uh, so I, I wanted to know when did you be, like become aware of hybrids when you were um, in your um, in the Air Force, or like when did you become aware of that, and when did that information become known? And would you be able to talk about um, one or two ways uh, that uh, that are used to uh, identify hybrids, if if possible? Um, the Katie Smith story, which I had an episode in Gaia. Uh, Katie was a um, um, well. I'm not, I don't have time to tell the entire story, but she uh, was an intelligence officer and um, she was uh, unique in a n number of ways. And makes a long story short, she identified herself as being a hybrid and um, she then worked. Uh, she was in OSI. Um, she worked, she was a, a, a counterintelligence officer. She worked with me. And then she uh, then went into a special. Uh, unit that uh, was to identify hybrids uh, in the military, primarily in the military. And she had uh, ways of determining um, how you could detect them. And there's a, a whole whole list of different ways, uh, but, you know, I'm not going to go through all of them right here, but uh, there are ways to determine uh, if a person is, is, is suspected of being a hybrid. Now, I'm not saying just because they have uh, different eye movements and um, different uh, irises and the sclera is a little bit different and their ear shapes are different and uh, their fingernails are different. Uh, doesn't make them a hybrid, but uh, they could very well be. Cool. Thank you. Can I, jump in real hey, I, I have a question real quick, just piggybacking off of that. Are there behavioral things that would maybe tell and if so are there any that you can discuss yeah they they, they uh you can they're not capable of lying number one at least this is what uh we're told and they have a uh temperament that is as calm as 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 can be uh they 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 don't have a, a they don't have a temper i should say um, and there's a lot of other uh, uh, mannerisms that they distinguish, but you know, again, I, I'm not going to go into all, every one of them. And then again, the whole thing. See, this is just an example of the whole. The whole thing would be classified, but I'm just saying. I didn't say that every one of them. I said they could very well have these traits, but it doesn't wouldn't make them. A hybrid. 
So I'll just leave it. I understand yeah. what you mean. Yeah. A certain president say um, very high emotional intelligence and an ability to regulate emotion in a high ability way. Am I understanding? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, NHI, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, quick question for Rick. Um, I've heard this um, talked about before, but just wanted to know if you think uh, or have heard anything about that maybe the actual even bigger reason why the government may be so resistant to disclosure is not so much that there's a presence here, but that they know that people will start asking about abductions and they would be forced to admit that they were powerless to stop the abductions from happening. So just wondering about that. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, the government can't tell the public that, yes, we're in contact with extraterrestrials, uh, five races or ten ra or ten or whatever it is, uh, but and one of them is hostile and they abduct human beings and they, they do these horrible experiments on them. No, the government can't do that. So, therefore, uh, that's going to be a question. I don't care how the, the um, disclosure phenomena is addressed and brought to the public forum, um, that's going to be a question because there's so many ab abductees out there that have gone through these horrible situations that they're going to stand up and say, oh, hey, what about the species that, that I dealt with and, and so forth? And the government would be stuck in, a, in their corner of a ring saying, now be fighting the public on disclosing it or not disclosing it. So you're right. Absolutely right. That, is, that would be one, one reason. Thank you so much. James, go ahead. Uh, hi, um, I'm right in thinking that you know Kit Green, Rick. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, so I've just read a, there's an email chain between him, uh, Eric Davis, and Colm Colher from the early 2000s. And they're talking about how in the 80s, uh, Kit Green very nearly got himself read into the program because they needed a doctor. And um, apparently during this time, he got briefed several times at the Pentagon and they showed him autopsy reports. And he couldn't verify whether they're genuine just from reading them and seeing the film. But also during that time, um, stuff started showing up at his house. Like he actually got sent autopsy reports, he got sent a tissue sample, and uh, he took them to the labs of some of his friends that he knows and they determined that it was a fake, but a very, very, very well done, sophisticated fake, using like technology that was a little bit more advanced at the time. And that kind of sounds like uh, he was getting some kind of op around him. You know, somebody wanted him to believe that was going to happen. And ultimately, had, like, another briefing in the late 80s where he was denied access. Um, so I was wondering if you know anything about that whole that whole situation and if he ever did get read into anything like that. Uh, I'll let Dr. Green speak. That's the question of the night, by the way, Rick. Come on, man. Give us something on that one, Rick. Come on. Dr. Green... Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go into detail. There's a lot of classified programs that we did. Um, I worked with even intelligence before that. And there's, there's programs that are probably still special access. And there's, um, there's just parts of this that I'm, I'm not going to go into. So, so like I said, I'll let him speak for himself and I'm not going to uh, delve yeah. into uh, is James is James on the right path? I mean, would you say no, James? Get off that path. You're you're on the wrong path. Or if he wanted to stay on that path, you think he'd be wasting his time? If he's traveling on that path, I'd say stay on that path. <laughs> nice. Thank you. That's all. Sometimes there's answers in the things that aren't said. Thanks for waiting, M. Go ahead. Hey, thanks. Yeah, I just want to ask them. Um, are you aware of any evidence that, uh, aside from abductions, there are uh, people who are simply being surveilled by NHIs on Earth? Oh, that's a good question. I, I don't... Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, if they are not... Yeah, yeah, I would have to say yes, and that would be hybrids. Obviously, they're kept track of. Whoever uh, created them, or, or uh, mixed their DNA with from ours to, and theirs, or something that I think, yeah, I think they would be being monitored. But abductees, I don't know. Uh, probably though, 
but anything other than abductees and, and hybrids, I, I wouldn't know. Okay, maybe this next question is a little bit harder to answer. Is every hybrid explicitly aware that they are a hybrid? Uh, <laughs> you know, not having, you know, able to ask them, uh, uh, at least the ones that we dealt with, I have to be very careful, um, and that uh, Katie uh, identified, uh, knew they were. I'll just leave it at that. Okay, yeah. Th Could thank perhaps you a hybrid find out who they are by a lot of self-introspection, meditation, travel. Do you know what I mean? Like, is part of understanding who you are as far as hybridism goes. Well, I can tell you. Uh, a sense of self-awareness and developing that and healing maybe some wounds and on and on. Yeah. Well, I can tell you the Katie S Smith story. She grew up in Montana with the, she knew from an early age she was different from, from other kids. Um, and, but she didn't know she, growing up she was hybrid and she um she went to college at uh i think university of montana or man montana state wanted to and um uh, in her um s between her junior and senior year she was out uh, with a friend uh another a girlfriend out traveling out at, at camping or something and they were up in this uh, mountain <clears throat> and they were sitting talking and all of a sudden Katie disappears, and her friend immediately, you know, runs and gets in a car and drives, as this way before cell phones, drives to uh, the nearest house to call the sheriff. Uh, my friend disappeared. So the sheriff comes up, do a, do a search and rescue, and Katie shows up. During that disappearance, which was about a three-hour time period that, that she was missing, they told her she was a hybrid. The extraterrestrials, a species that was dealing with her, told her and said, prepare for, for the future. All these other things they told her. And now she can. Are these Ebens, Rick? Were these Ebens, or can you say which of the five that you, you're aware of were they? Um, no, I'm not going to say which one because um, there's an obvious reason why I can't say that. But, but so she comes back, she goes to her senior year and goes to college, and her friend knew something was wrong with her, but kept asking, where'd you go? Well, I wandered away or whatever it was. And then um, she immediately was uh, had a calling to be in the military. She wanted to go into the military as an officer. So she, in her last uh, semester of college, she joined ROTC at, 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 in college, Air Force ROTC. And during, um, you know, the during that pro that period of time, uh, she she had to ask her where she wanted to go in the Air Force afterwards, and she said, "I wanted to go in intelligence." And so she she tested high aptitude, got intelligence, aced all the different schools intelligence schools she had to go through, and ended up at Kirtland Air Force Base in the counterintelligence uh, office uh, with me. So. And of course, at, at the time, we didn't know we we didn't know anything about it. But there were indicators in her schooling. Um, our instructors in in the intelligence operations course up in Washington and in Virginia, where they would have to go through, they 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 noticed strange things about her. But I don't know that we knew. I don't know, and I was never briefed that we knew about. Like what, Rick? Will you give us some ex a couple of examples what we would have considered like strange? I'm curious. Well, she had she had intelligence. She had um, really uh, one of the courses you take in, in the intelligence operations courses is celestial navigation, uh, and there's a reason why. There's a lot of special operations personnel, the combat controllers, uh, and, and 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 special forces people. They take celestial navigation meaning. It just means to navigate by the stars. Know how to, if you're out there in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a compass, how to determine where north, south, east, west is and how to navigate. And that's, that's what it is. But she already knew it. There was any indication of where she took this course, 
but she knew everything there was to know about the stars and, and celestial navigation. That's one indicator, and there's others that I'm not going to go into, but that's just one that stood out that one of the instructors told me. She she already knew everything that we were talking about in the class. She she would help. She came with a knowing, didn't she? A certain knowing. Yeah, she had a, she a, a, that's a good way to put it right there. Yeah, I understand. Do you, um, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, eight more speakers. So I show, I've got Sunshine, Flylo, Lou, Edwin, Dr. Oliver, J. Neal, and AKA. There's also two speakers waiting. So I don't know how much longer you'd like to go, but Sunshine would be up next. Thanks. Uh, so I could speak now or do you? Yeah, go ahead, uh, okay. Sunshine. So I have uh, a lot to say on a number of different topics related to here. Um, I'm definitely human, definitely. Did you have a question, though, for oh. Rick? That's, is the, yeah, yeah, the space is more about just, like, direct questions. Oh, okay, I was going to share some information, because he was speaking about healing tech, and that's, like, my core interest. Um, but if I have one question... I guess it would be the Holloman footage. So I saw the Holloman footage. It was on Lens. I don't know if someone put it on my plate, given some of the experiences I describe um, that happened or are true. Um, I'm not hybrid or any of that stuff. I'm 100% human. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, so the Holloman footage, I, I saw that, and I was very surprised, and there's absolutely no information regarding that, but they land... And this alien, like, with uh, blue-gray scaly skin gets out, and it's just, like, the oddest thing because there's no explanation. It just, like, cuts off right there. So, um, yeah, any more information regarding that I'd be curious about. But I just didn't take a photo. I, I was about to take a photo, but I, like, I was, like, busy or doing something else, and I was just like, oh, well, what the fuck? <laughs> I, I guess we'll leave it at that, but, yeah. Did you say with your troop, or did I mishear you? Uh, you misheard me. No, no, I was in, no. No, it, it was bad. on okay. TV. It was, like, available for rental. But I don't know if someone put that on my plate, I was saying, just given that maybe they know some of the experiences I described. Because I'm kind of vocal about uh, just the more advanced healing tech, and, like, I've seen other wavelengths. I have had, um, what's it called? Um, just, uh... Sunshine, are you asking if, like, um, I, it, it, tell me if I've got you wrong, but I feel like you're asking, can something be kind of pushed for you to watch? Uh, well, I wasn't asking so much that. To I was just more curious that what, what happened. What was the outcome of that? Because they didn't appear friendly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, here's what I know about that. Obviously, I wasn't just a young kid back then. I wasn't around then. But, um... The um, the Holloman case. If you look at look at the dates of the Holloman case, April twenty fourth of nineteen sixty four. Yeah. And the and the Lonnie Zamora case, April twenty fourth, nineteen sixty four. You notice it happened in the same exact date. And now what what I was told, and um, is that the when we were coordinating with the Ebens to come back to pick up Eben 1, the body and the bodies of the others, somehow the coordinates got mixed up and they landed in Socorro or outside Socorro uh, first and then they realized that eh, we're in the wrong place and somehow they ended up landing at Holloman. So that's that's all I know about the, the Holloman case. Uh, uh, there's a lot more that other people talk about it. Uh, Linda Howell talks about it because she interviewed Emma Nager, um, Rusty, uh, oh, what's Rusty's last name? Uh, there was a Rusty, uh, there's a um, UFO investigator from California years ago, and he, uh, San Francisco, he uh, had a lot of information, but that's, that's all I know. Okay, yeah, I was just curious, and then... Um... Yeah, regarding the healing tech, I know we don't have it, but, like, I know how to build all that stuff, given my experiences. Like, there's a different way to approach it, and essentially, the hand, the, 
the the waves the hands give off if you do it the wrong way you're gonna do more harm than anything um so you have to know what you're doing and i think you have to physically experience it in order to do that um but it's quite advanced like you can heal paralysis and any number of things when you engage that state which is like a very advanced thing um which i want to do i i hope i'm given a platform but you know um well, hey, yeah, uh, thank you for sharing. Hi. Uh, thank you for sharing, and come back. We got a lot of hands. We're just going. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, no, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Worries, I appreciate it, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, I appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Sunshine. I appreciate you sharing too. Go ahead, Flylo. Oh man, thank you. <laughs> hey, Rick. Uh, I'm tired. Oh, man, I'm like, <laughs> come on. Sorry. I mean, look. Thank you, Rick, for taking the time. I uh, I appreciate it. Um. I have a question. Uh, mine is just more so, can you give me a, I, I guess to the best of your knowledge, a kind of overview of what a retrieval may look like? Well, uh, yeah, there's set procedures. Um, I wish Wendell was still around. Uh, he, he would lecture for an hour on it. But anyways, uh, the, there would be a team's special uh, down aircraft recovery team stationed. Uh, I think there were 12 different bases around the United States, and then there were some overseas. And what, what and department they, would they be from? The United States Air Force. Okay. And they would contain, uh, number one, an OSI agent, uh, number two, a commander, <clears throat> somebody with aeronautical experience, that like a pilot, uh, hazardous material specialists, um, a biologist, a medical, a medical uh, doctor, um, and then uh, recovery, what they call recovery technicians that can actually pick up the stuff and, and probably equipment, certain type of equipment. So that's, that's, that's a recovery team. Real quick, Rick, could, could the Army also have had a recovery team? In other words, how many different military departments could have had their own recovery teams? Anything from the air to the ground is the Air Force. I don't, I don't know of any, never heard of any uh, Navy, I mean Army recovery team. Now, the, the Navy probably had them, but I don't, I don't, I, you know, I was never briefed into what the Navy had, so, uh, but I, I'm sure the Navy had them too, but but just the Air Force and Navy, as far as I know. So they would fly in generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They would they would fly in with equipment and and uh, now there's there's a lot of uh, uh, background to that, and there's a lot of there's a uh, the Federal Aviation Administration has two classified manuals, and you can Google this. If you don't believe me uh, that nobody knows what it is. Well, they're they're. Uh, and I'm not going to give away any everything that's in there, but um, there are procedures for notifying the United States Air Force in a search and rescue facility at Scott Air Force Base on down special aircrafts. And, there, and of course, obviously, there's a lot more in those those manuals. Uh, so, <clears throat> if if you are if you're, for instance, driving down a road and you see a, a UFO come over your car and and crash. Now you're going to stop and say, oh my God, you know, this is a crash. I call, I'm going to call 911. So wherever you're at, you call 911 and you tell them there's a down craft. And then um, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, police, uh, local police or sheriffs or state police, highway patrol would, would, would respond. And then from that point on, there would be a notification system uh, and that would go through FAA, and then the FAA would take the realms and say, okay, you know, contact DART team at whatever base is closest and, and send them. Okay, we got we to gotta move around eight hands, Fly, but thank you for your okay. contribution. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Lou, go ahead. <clears throat> thank you. And again, I appreciate all the questions. I mean, I know my questions are seemed as tough or whatever but I can assure you I'm not a fucking counterintelligence agent or anything like that I'm not trying to get you in a gotcha although I did get you in a gotcha um, the one thing that stuck out to me that you said Rick uh, when I explained my relationship with Louis Elizondo 
And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but I have to preface this by saying that I organized hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours into the largest UAP grass movements effort ever organized for Lou Elizondo. When you, when I mentioned that, you said, well, yeah, he's a counterintelligence agent. So my question to you is, is that my fault that I got taken advantage of, manipulated and blackmailed by Lou Elizondo? And why is that okay? And if so, why is that okay? And if it's not okay, why should we trust Lou Elizondo when he uses people in the community like that? Well, no, I, 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 I'm sorry if you interpreted it that way. I mean, I was a joke that you said that uh, he, he, he did that to you. And I said, thought, well, he's a counterintelligence officer. That's okay. Not, All right. I don't mean anything. Okay. I appreciate I, that. I, but, but it was just a joke. I okay. didn't mean it. Well, no, that's fine. But his question, his question, hold on, hold on, let me just, hold on, let me just, I I think that it's kind of like that analogy, if you're going to pet the bulldog, you should be aware the bulldog could bite. So I believe that there's a little bit of that as well. Yeah, we have the ability as well to know who we're talking with. So I'm just. Okay, but let me help out. Let me help out, Lou, because I actually. Um, I watched Luke from the beginning and I saw the whole thing unwind. And so I have a, a little piece of my heart that goes out to that guy. So he, he has a fair question, Rick. I mean, I understand that you want to be careful what you say about anybody, but he had an experience. He was, he was, Lou was all in on disclosure. He was trying to uh, help the process. He had a great round, I mean, tremendous round table of people. I mean, that was historic in, in some ways and then he feels and i don't know the whole story he feels that lou let him down on many levels if you were advising lou uh, or somebody that would in the future forget forget lou elizondo if somebody were to come along in the future how would you advise that they go about making decisions if they want to involve themselves uh, with, somebody? Clint, with all due respect um thank you for that i appreciate it but i don't want to hear about you know, people that are not existing in the community. I'd like to know Rick's opinion about those tactics used against American citizens who are doing nothing but trying to help. Well, why that, should we that, trust? That, that, why that should we like trust Dr. Dr. Like Zondo? Hypocrisy one one, though. He wasn't talking about Americans. He's like just being. Hypocritical. Okay, hold on, hold on. You can't interrupt. Now, sir, whoever that is, Lou asked Rick a question. It's Rick's the host. Rick's going to answer the question. Yeah, you know, Lou, Lou, Lou I, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know what Lou's intentions were to do what he did to you. If he did, in fact, that, I would I would uh, feel as bad as you are uh, that you do about what, what Lou uh, did to you. I mean, uh, so I, I don't know. You'd have to ask Lou about that, but uh, well, unfortunately he won't return any of my calls or texts, but I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to, that's why I ask you the questions that I ask you. Cause I'm really trying to look out for the community of people and all of these researchers here that are trying to research all this stuff. That's why I want better, better facts, better. I want to set a higher bar, Rick. And what, I want to, what do you think I, is I, I the reason aware of this, Lou, like, these issues? What do you, what, what, do you th what, what, what do you think is the reason? Please don't talk over people. People have had their hands on a very long time. Just wait your turn, Mr. Thing, please. Thank you. Okay, Lou, let's, Lou and just let, wrap up your, your point. Uh, you know, I appreciate your point, but then we're going to move over to another hand. Yeah, no, I, again, I'm just wondering why we should, why we don't <laughs> call people out, especially when their pinned tweet is, you know, I'll never tell a lie. I'll always tell the truth. I'll always, you know, I'll never support any sort of manipulation within this community. And then we get manipulated. And it's like, I, that's why I'm trying to set a higher bar. And that's why I would love for you to come talk to me and come talk to these, these veterans that want answers just as bad as everyone. But I just don't want to bring in... Um, pre you know pre-existing belief systems and ask you questions based off of our beliefs just so you can just confirm these belief systems i want to i want to push back in the most respectful way possible but how do we do that rick without insulting you okay that was your question okay uh uh i just got one um 
uh, let me let me. Uh, this good question too that I just got uh, that somebody was trying to ask, but this is really really good question that uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, says, uh, uh, and this is from somebody I know quite well. If the Air Force was the only branch responsible for crash retrieval, then Clifford Stone, who, who served in the United States Army, lied about his experiences with crash retrieval. Can you explain what you know about this? And and so that's that's a good good point. And that's good point. that was gonna that was gonna be my point, by the way, Rick. Okay, that's exactly what my point was gonna be. I let it go though. Yeah. Now, what I can say is I knew nothing about an army. And I'm only talking about me here. Um, I don't know anything about an army recovery system, but Clifford spoke, and I, Clifford was a friend of mine. He lived a few hundred miles from me here in New Mexico, and I supported Clifford in the ways that nobody would believe. But um, I, I sat for hours and hours listening to Clifford tell his story, both at UFO con conventions, and here in my in my living room, and or my office, which uh, Eric knows exactly, has been here, and at his house down in Roswell, and he he spoke from the heart. But every time we spoke, I made it clear to Clifford, I knew nothing about what the army did back in those days, and he was he was in before me. So I said, so. I can't sit sit there and 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 talk to him and say no, it never happened. I just know what the Air Force did and what the Air Force had. So if there was in fact a a crash recovery team that Clifford was on, and I think he was on, I think he had some connections because of his so many um, very well. You had you saw the material, yeah. right, Rick? Yeah. You saw his material. Yes, so. I did. And you know he had the meta material, as far as I'm right, concerned. He had two, two boxes of it, and and well, a, a two boxes in a, in a in a bag in his garage that he didn't want to bring in his house for obvious reasons. But um, he he spoke from the heart, and and I'm you know, I was a pretty good interrogator uh, when I was in. You can tell mannerisms about people lying and looking. And he didn't. He didn't display any of those mannerisms of somebody that was a, a compulsive liar or a liar. So, uh, so that's what I have to say about Clifford. I just didn't know about any army, uh, U.S. Army recovery. So I hope that answers. I just want to make a quick comment about Clifford Stone because I was lucky enough to meet him and and go to his house, and that's a long story. But the the point I want to make is that. Um, I don't. I think it is because of Clifford Stone and nobody else that I've been able to find the book that he published that you can't buy anymore that has the FOIAs that he FOIAed that have your name and your signature and Paul Benowitz. It's like I think six pages. There might even be more, but those must have been declassified because he got them. Did you help him get those pages, or did he get those on his own, Rick? Some of them I did. Uh, I pushed him in the right direction, so to speak, to get to get those uh, documents. Uh, he had um, he had four different, I, I should say, remnants of four different reports. And one of the one of the uh, documents, the one about the Paul Benowitz, uh, I think he got that from Wendell Stevens because Wendell Stevens was one of three people that I know that got a, a, a good majority. Well, not the good majority parts of the Benowitz uh, files, except for the redaction. So I, I think Clifford got, uh, I helped him in some ways, and Robert Dean, another good friend of him, and also Paula Harris helped him in other ways. Can you say, and I, I already know what you're going to say, but I want you to say it publicly, uh, on your life, on your family's life, are those documents authentic? I mean, were they, were they faked in any way? No. Absolutely not. I didn't think so. They look pretty real to me, and I had them checked. That's bad. I'm just going to tell you guys, you know, I was never sure whether I wanted to go all in on Rick Doty, but when I saw those documents, that put the needle in another direction, much higher up the ladder. I can promise you that. Because there are documents that prove a lot of what Rick Doty says about Paul Penowitz. 
Thank you, guys. Do you want to move on to more speakers, or did you want to touch base on any more of this topic? Uh, one thing I want to say is the uh, somebody's tried to trick me in a tin city in, in Alaska. Uh, one event, one crash site was in 1971, discovered n near Nome, a uh, place it was Tin City Air, Sta Air Force Station. A uh, Tin City Air Force Station is, in fact, the real place. You can Google it. It's near Nome. There were, whereby in the period of 1969 to 1976, there were literally hundreds of UFO reports around Nome. Uh, the second place that was ad adjacent to the um, U.S. border, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, well, the Canadian and U.S. border is called Bellamy Pasture. And I'm not sure uh, if that's a town or what. And that was in 1968. So I just wanted to, uh, somebody graciously sent me that information uh, just now. So I just want to say that whoever was trying to trick me um, and said, ah, oh, it never happened. I just made that up. There really were. If you made it up, you're a psychic and you already know about it. So anyways, I'm ready for the next question. Who's next? Okay. Then? Okay, so uh, here's the lineup. Edwin, Dr. Oliver, J. Neal, a.k.a. Scotty, uh, Sam Mixon, Mr. Thing, Kent, and then Lone J. So, Edwin, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity, uh, Richard. I just have a, a couple of quick questions for you uh, regarding the U.S. Space Force. Um, you know how we just recently formed it. So this begs the question, have we, as in the U.S. government, traveled into the cosmos uh, using our own man-made alien tech? Ah. How many thousands of miles? Of, how many thousands of miles is the cosmos, Rick? I mean, 23,000 or more? I mean, what are we talking about? I'm, I'm talking about, like, you know, uh, you know, visiting planets, you know, that sort of thing. I don't know. I, I have no idea. Um, okay. I, I don't know anything other than um, than uh, the secret space program that I knew about um, involved deep uh, satellites positioned in, in deep space and around uh, different orbits of U uh, Neptune and um, and so forth. Uh, special space probes uh, and satellites. I, I don't know anything about Tra the uh, um, traveling to any planets by some kind of special space vehicles or anything like that. So that's okay. all I can say. I, I just My, don't know that. I have a, another follow-up question, and this is regarding um, ex-U.S. Marine Michael Herrera. I don't know if you've heard about him, but you know he he was doing some um, assistance in Indonesia after a tsunami had hit the area, and he encountered what he believes is uh, a U.S. Um, like man-made U.S. Yeah, he, Rich, I'm not to cut you off, bro. He knows the story. Okay. What, the other question. The other question, of question is, um, you know, you know, uh, as far as our man-made tech that maybe you may or may not know, um, is is do you believe if there's any sort of truth for uh, to his story? Well, I did to. Um maybe three programs with him on Gaia and I uh, there 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 are some aspects of that I I, I question me on but uh, you know most of it is factual and was fact based so that's all I can say okay well great well thank you so much uh, for taking the time I appreciate you welcome thanks Edwin go ahead dr. Oliver thank you for letting me ask another question um, Rick, I don't know whether you can help with this one or not, really, but um, I've been following the investigations into the Wendelstrom Forest incident, uh, led by Professor Simon Holland, John Burroughs, and a couple of other investigators. Um, they've been posting the results of their work on YouTube over the last couple of years. Um, where they seem to have gotten to is um, a suggestion that the incident itself was caused by man-made technology that seems in some way to have interacted with something highly strange, possibly NHI. Um, I just wondered whether... In the, 
Hello? So, so you, you have a bad humming sound in the background. Can you hear me now? You have a question about the... I just want to say this, that Jim Peniston, in my opinion, based on my research, told the truth, and I think he should be the first person people should consider about that. Yeah, I fully agree. I fully agree. Um, I think I think I think the gist of my question was just whether Rick is it was at any point partial to any information about the incident that he's able to share with us. He may not, but I just thought I'd ask. I, I, you know what? At some point, you uh, you were muted or something, or something, or somebody had a microphone. I couldn't hear the, all your question though. So you're echoing that. Lone has got his mic on. I mean, turn your mic off, guys. Okay, so when Rick is talking, Dr. Oliver, you want to mute. And when Dr. Oliver's talking, Rick will mute. And then that'll eliminate your echo, okay? Yeah, and Mike, uh, Disclosure, I think, has his mic on. I might be wrong, though. No, I show him muted. Go ahead, Dr. Oliver. Yeah, thanks. Glad we sorted that out. So, um, so essentially, the question was about the Rendlesham Forest. Yeah, can I... Okay. Um, the question was about the Rendlesham Forest incident. Um, I've been following a group of researchers on YouTube led by Professor Simon Holland. Um, John Burroughs, who is one of the experiences of, of, of that event, is involved in the investigations that they've been uh, pursuing. They seem to think, or seem to have reached the conclusion, that the incident itself consisted of some kind of interaction between man-made technology, possibly a weapons test, that interacted with something unexpected, basically um, something highly strange, possibly NHI. Um, I was just wondering, because going back, this was sort of in kind of your kind of era, Rick, were you partial to any um, briefings about this? Is there anything that you can share with us about that event? Well, well, the, the only, only thing, thing I knew is uh, the OSI agent that handled that case, one of them, there's many there, uh, Cunningham, uh, um, I knew him very well, and um, um, he, he spoke, he has spoken many, many, many times over the years about that. Also, in 1984, I was in headquarters, OSI, and in reference to the investigation uh, that we were doing in New Mexico, uh, Colonel Law, who was the Chief of Counterintelligence, asked me to read an OSI case file. And it was highly classified at the time. Colonel Law gave me the complete AF OSI case file and with the Randlesham uh, UFO incident of 1987-1980. And uh, the reason he, he asked me to read it is because in the same time period, in December 1980, we had an incident happen at Kirtland Air Force Base where a UFO landed. So. Uh, and there were a lot of similarities between them. And he wanted me to read this to see if there were similarities in, in, in comparison to the case that I did. And this was four years after the incident happened. So I haven't read that entire case file. But one of the things that um, uh, is quite interesting is the uh, what happened when the Air Force sent uh, the materials um, the soil and tree bark and rocks <coughs> to um, two different laboratories in the United States. And one of the labs was the Department of Agriculture the laboratory uh, in Maryland. And they tried to imitate the distortion of the plants and the bark and could not do it in the laboratory. They could not generate enough heat or energy in a direct beam that could cause that type of mutation to the plants uh, in the, um, the soil around. I always thought that was a very interesting uh, uh, explanation for the soils. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there, burls, and I mean, there's a number of people out there that have, uh, that were there, that talked about it. Um, allegedly didn't know they broke books about it. Um, but the conclusion in the, uh, um, the OSI report was that there was some Air Force security policemen that falsified reports and falsified information. And so, um, and some of them took polygraph examinations. So, 
<coughs> that's all I know about the, uh, the Revolution Force, Force, whether it was a real event or, I mean, I believe uh, the Lieutenant Colonel uh, who um, you know, did the recording and um, and there was another person who was not even ever mentioned in any in the report outside the OSI report, the lieutenant, the female lieutenant, that uh, talks uh, great in great details about the, the case. But so that's that's it. That's all I know. We got a lot of hands. We got to move. We got to move around, Jenny. Okay, I just wanted to let Rick know, for a little bit you were echoing, I don't know what kind of mic you're using, but it was kind of going in and out of an echo. Uh, the next person up is Jay Neal. Well, it looks like Jay Neal left, so that would be AKA. Hey, AKA, thanks for Oh, waiting. yeah, no problem, thank you. Uh, so, Rick, the uh, Advanced Working Group, does that fall under the spirit of the old Advanced the theoretical physics working group or is it more like a sort of a fight club situation just curious if you were willing to share anything about that group any specifics or anything i'm not sure about a fight group <clears throat> no the advanced working group was formed in 19 or about 1999 2000 i didn't join it for a year and a half later uh, it's made up of retired intelligence officers military people um and and they, and they formed and there's we have a couple uh, former uh, DCIs in there um commanders and they we just get together we we are trying to facilitate disclosure in our own way <clears throat> we're one of many groups that are out there trying to do the same thing and that's you know that's, that's we're a semi private group we don't we don't uh have the websites and we have our own uh, secure communication system through uh, SIGINT and, um, and or, uh, SIGNAL um, C, C Act uh, is a, is a uh, encryption system you buy and, and put in. So that's 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 who we are. Rick, real quick, if, if an event were to occur, let's say in uh, New Mexico tomorrow, uh, would, is there a possibility that people within the advanced working group would become interested and try to facilitate the investigation if they felt that there might be a cover-up going on? Yeah, that's what we did out of Las Vegas. Uh, we, we put a lot of resources in the ground. We do have somebody, uh, not, not all of us are, are, are wealthy. I mean, we're financially secure, but we do have somebody who supports us financially um, and, and Eric knows who that is and others uh, but and then when something like that happens uh, we we send people out to uh, look into it just to see if there's if it's a hoax or you know if it's it's real or there's chances are that it's real we may get bits and pieces of information from the uh, investigative people on the scene. Obviously, we don't have security clearances, so we can't get classified information. But uh, there's ways to communicate back and forth across the, uh, that that problem. Rick, do you guys? Okay, cool. Who was it? Who had, who had their hand up next? Uh, next would be Scotty, and then Scotty after you is Sam Mixon, then Kent, then Lone Jay, then Steve. Anybody else want to be in the lineup? Please raise your hand. Thank you. Go ahead, Scotty. Hi there, Rick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hear you great. Uh, Rick, I've got a question for you. Uh, this uh, UAP technology, is there any reference to Egyptian hieroglyphs included in it? I don't, I don't have any knowledge of that. Uh, there's other people out there that, that claim that, but I, I'm not going to speak for them. John Enoch and others have talked about it, but I, I don't know personally, no. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm asking is uh, about four years ago, I conducted a small experiment. I'm a gold panner, and uh, I received gold through an experiment. And since then, I can interpret cuneiform language and Egyptian hieroglyphs. Wow, interesting. Uh, interesting. It's very interesting because it, it, for what I'm reading... What they're talking about is our electromagnetic field and an electromagnetic attraction system for this planet. Wow. And hey, uh, 
can can you send me uh, your email? I can get you in touch with somebody. Yeah, be yeah. interested in that. Yeah, certainly. Uh, there seems to be a, a, a lot of knowledge about uh, their construction system being silicon photonic using the wavelengths or quarks from certain star constellations for fusion at the core of our planet. Wow. That is that is the, the bomb drop of the yeah. afternoon, I have to say that. Yeah. Um, my my email is T like top end, T O P P A N one six six at gmail dot com. Okay, well, I don't have a pen just now, but obviously you've got people listening. Uh, yeah. But I can certainly interpret it. I certainly understand how they were getting their gold. Uh, but more importantly, it was about stepping up the fields of our planet to create a living biosphere. And what we are living in is basically a planet that was converted from a mothership. Uh, I know how that sounds, I don't take drugs or anything like that, but uh, it was disconnected because the fusion process ate up the core for the inside of the planet. Wow. We've got to make that movie, Rick, put that on the list, yeah. get a hold yeah. of somebody. <laughs> All right, so uh, I know it seems weird, but uh, I'm an amateur radio enthusiast, licensed to M0 VPZ. Uh, I've made hydrogen cells and stuff like that. I've been into CNC, pneumatics, you name it, I've done it. And uh, as, a, as a hobby gold partner, I get my gold from uh, rich iron oxide deposits. And I fell along the course of looking at where the Egyptians got their gold. I understand that through reading the language that the pyramids actually ran on steam. And the water went into the middle pyramid at Khafre and touched on the mantle which created steam and the condensation then uh, allowed the electrical conduit to, to happen, the electrical conductivity for the height of the structure through a primary coil above the subterranean, uh, above the king's chamber in Khufu, through a secondary coil in the grand gallery and a tertiary coil that wraps around the inside of, of, of the pyramid structure. Uh, and okay, did humans create that is what I want to know. Did... Humans like no. you and I create that a no. an advanced no. race of beings. No, from what I read from the from the hieroglyphs and the cuneiform language, we actually came from a different solar system, uh, and we came here using uh, quantum tunneling, and it was the same system that used the false doorways. It's something to do with electro the, th uh, the third law of electrodynamics. In so you're tunnels. saying humans were brought to Earth? Is that what you're saying? Uh, for what I can read from the structure, we were created here to fix this planet. But somehow... Okay, you got, you got a question for Rick? Because we got a lot of hands up, bro, but you're very interesting. We appreciate your input. Yeah, the question is, is if there is something in connection with that, then I can read this, this language as best as possible. Uh, and I'm here if they want to contact me. Okay. Thank you for your contribution. Okay. Yeah, I, I posted I posted my uh, email on in and X. So uh, okay, I'll contact you, buddy. You, you can okay. Thanks, thanks. Hi, it's very interesting. Good night. Good night, Benny, Benny, could I jump ahead because I've got to go out. Yeah, we're gonna let Kent jump ahead because that's what he's good okay. at. Go ahead, Kent. And then after Kent, we'll go to Sam. Thanks for waiting. Go ahead, Kent. No apologies, folks. Hi, Rick. Hi. Eric and everyone, Vinny, everyone, it's, um, I, I've got to yeah. travel, so I have to drop down to listen, but I just wanted to ask Rick, um, Rick, are you aware of any UFOs being recovered by the Navy? Is that, you know, because we talk about the Air Force recovering, you know, craft on the land and in the air, but are we aware of any UFOs that have been recovered? Cheers, mate. Oh, wow. Um, I don't have, I never was in, obviously briefed in any kind of naval program when I was in the Air Force, um, OSI. So, um, but there's a, there's a, a, a admiral um, who has spoke at conventions and, and so forth. Um, and he has uh, talked about, uh, he was a submarine commander for 21 years. And he saw all sorts of strange things down here. And he saw 
uh, in one particular incident when they were um, he was traveling in a submarine down uh, in, off the coast of Perth, Australia, in, in the Indian Ocean. He saw uh, they were surfaced and a, uh, a refueling or a, 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 a resupply ship was there offloading stuff onto the submarine. And then an object came from the southeast, from Antarctica, up uh, over the submarine, and then uh, circled it, and then went directly into the water. And that, so when the resupply ended, uh, he commanded the submarine to, to, dig, to, to dive deep to try to figure out what it was. And um, he, he went as far deep as the other the submarine could go and that of course that's not classified but i think he says something around 3600 feet um uh, anyways he couldn't they couldn't catch it um so that's the only thing i know about usos he's he talked about many other incidents but i haven't heard anyone talk about recovering them in the ocean i'm i'm, I'm not saying they haven't i just i just don't know anything about that Thanks so much, okay. Rick. Thanks, Who's next? Uh, next up is Sam Mixon. Thanks for waiting. Hello, can you, hear me? can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. We're hearing, we're hearing you, Sam. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, oh, what was it? Oh, yeah. Uh, are you, I, remember, I think I saw a post from you um several maybe like five months ago or so talking about the aviary and asking the government about disclosure and they said no i'm not sure if it was your account or if it was a false account but um what was your if you were a part of the aviary what was your code name i know scott jones was chickadee um ron was uh i think the pelican kit green was i don't remember kit green's code name in terms of the aviary, but what was your code name and what was the, um, the goal and also a uh, function of the aviary in terms of disclosure? I was Sparrow. Um, and um, it, first of all, it, it, the group started back in the 80, uh, late 70s, early 80s, um, and uh, it was a quasi government. Um, group that uh, was trying to get some form of disclosure out, and uh, that's the best way. Of was that a study group also? I mean, were those guys all studying yeah, there was, what was going on? There was, it was a study group. It was, and we did a lot of different things, and some of which is probably so classified, but um, I was the uh, Sparrow, and I was the youngest uh, guy in the group. Uh, the Falcon was Richard Helms, uh, and we were trying to, we met periodically, we were trying to get things done, uh, and, and, and that's, that's the library that, uh, I don't remember. Brad Cameron's making a movie about it, right, Rick? Yes, yes, the movie's being made. And Nicole, Nicole Sackage, I think, is helping out with that. Yes, she is. But that's the library. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, Lone J, thanks for waiting. Go ahead. The stage is yours. Hi. Um, so my questions are for Rick. Uh, can you hear me, Rick? Yes, I can. Hey, um, so uh, I'm just really looking for your opinion on these questions. I'm not looking to poke a prod or get any facts. Um, so with the way things seem at the moment, you know, with the current state of the world, uh, I feel like, you know, shouldn't we be revealing everything now so we can at least have a chance at turning things around? Um, with the start of AI, um, you know, past its growth, we, we don't, we don't, if we don't reveal something now, the truth won't matter later because it'll be kind of, it'll be hard to discern between truth from fiction um, so, you know, I was just wondering, you know, how you felt about that, and, um, who do you think really has control over disclosure? Uh, is it the ETs, 
or the government or are they the same thing? Um, and last question is, uh, what do you, what's your opinion on uh, the Nazis' involvement in the uh, UAP subject? Well, I, I, I agree that disclosure should be now. Uh, that's why I'm out here. That's why uh, our group is working so hard to try to facilitate disclosure. But um, it's going to be up to the government. It's going to be up to certain entities, whistleblowers, Congress, uh, to to uh, motivate and uh, streamline um, the process so we could get disclosure out to the to the American people. Uh, I don't. I don't have any knowledge about the, the, the Nazis uh, and what the Nazis did. Uh, I'm a history buff, but, you know, there's, a, there's just, a, a, just not a whole lot of information pertaining to the subject that was written back then. I know there's, there's, there's people in Germany and other places that are writing about what the Nazis did, and they're writing today, era, uh, but not r writing back in the uh, 650s, 60s, and 70s when some really, really, really good information was presented in history books. So I can't, I can't, uh, I don't know. I don't think they were, I don't think they had the bell, but there's the explanation for what it, that was. And, and so I, I'm just saying that I don't, I don't think the Nazis, and that's just my opinion. I was involved in that, In other words, it could have been like propaganda. In other words, it could have been like Russian propaganda. Nowadays, we call it German propaganda. Or even we put out propaganda information to make the enemy think that we've got something that we don't have. Is that, a, is that accurate? A, ex exactly, exactly. That's highly, highly, highly possible.